We're going verse by verse and chapter by chapter through the incredible book of 2 Corinthians, Paul the Apostle's most intimate pastoral letter, if you will, where he shares his apostle's heart, his pastor's heart, his shepherd's heart. And as we're going through this passage of Scripture, the Corinthians and Paul had uh, really become sideways with each other in a number of ways. And there was a, a group that were really detractors, if you will, away from the, Paul the Apostle and not really wanting to receive from him. And yet as Paul the Apostle in this passage of Scripture begins to um, really share his heart about a severe letter and difficult situation where there had been sin in the church and, and Paul had uh, encouraged them and exhorted them to deal with this sin that was going on in the church. And so as we look at our message here this evening, it's the triumph of serving God. You see, ministry, as long as there's people, it's, it's kind of messy. It's kind of like a family. Uh, families are not neat and tidy. There's a lot of difficulties that go on within the family or the extended family or moms or dads or grandpas or Uncle Eddie and, uh, you know, wh whoever they might be. And in the church family is that way too. There's a lot of things that have to be dealt with. There, sin needs to be confronted, and then there needs to be repentance, and then there needs to be forgiveness, and then, and then there needs to be that restoration of a whole and full relationship. And as we see the triumph, really, of, of serving God, God has given us the tools. Paul the Apostle is laying out to us how to work through some very difficult situations. And I want to share with you basically these uh, four thoughts from this passage that are a general outline and then uh, very specifically a lot more detail. But the very first thing that we're going to see is our, our triumph uh, of restoration. How do you restore when sin has kind of just busted everything up? It's just broken things down. How, how do we fix that? And let's look at it as we pick it up in verse 5 of chapter 2, and we'll read through verse 11 and then spend some time kind of unpacking some uh, great spiritual food for you and I. It says, But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man, so that, on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him, for to this end I also wrote, that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Paul the Apostle here is dealing with something that most Bible teachers believe took place back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And that was, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, only giving you verse 1, the situation. And Paul does a, basically in, gives them instruction all the way through verse 8 of that chapter. But in 1 Corinthians 5, 1, it says, It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. There was a sinful situation going on in the church. And you might, uh, if you're not used to church life, you might be shocked by that. Uh, but being in the church for about 30 years, I'm pretty much not shocked by anything that goes on within the church life and, and believers that say that they know the Lord. And Paul the Apostle is, this is his follow-up letter, that this individual that was in this sin, ultimately, like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 17, he, he says, you know, if somebody uh, has offended in sin, that you go confront them one-on-one. -on -one. And if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. And if not, then you take two or three witnesses. And um, ultimately, that if somebody won't listen, then you tell it to the church. And if they won't listen to the church, then you kick them out, if you will. They're in, under church discipline. And they're kicked out of church fellowship. And basically what you're doing is pushing them out away from the covering and protection of the people of the Lord. And so that the flesh might be destroyed, Paul says, that their spirit might be saved. Ultimately, you're just taking away all the protection and you're delivering them over to Satan, which is a scary terminology just to even think about it. But this is what the scriptures teach. And so this man, this is what had happened. He was involved sexually with his father's wife. And the, way, the wording of it makes it sound like it was his stepmom. Now, is that troubling or what? <laughs> you're now in an adulterous affair with your, your stepmom. 
ooh. I mean, can things get any more weird than that? It's just like an icky, kind of awful situation. But this is the bad thing. It wasn't not only was he in the sin, this guy, and, and this couple, it appears were, they had, I don't know if dad's now brokenhearted and they had moved in together. I don't know what the situation is. But now they're coming to church every week, and the whole church knows it, but nobody's dealing with it. Nobody's taking care of any kind of spiritual confrontation or love or, 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 or discipline. And so Paul the Apostle said, I'm not even there, and I've already dealt with this situation. So you need to disfellowship that guy until he repents. And when he repents, then this is what this letter is all about. It's about forgiveness and restoring. Can I share with you, as it says here in verse 5, but if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me, but all of you to some extent, not to be too severe. He says, you know, this person that had caused grief in the church, when somebody gets in hard-hearted rebellion in their sinful life, and they know God, and they're in the congregation of the Lord, you know what? It causes everybody grief. It creates this terrible witness. People are troubled. People are stumbled. People out in the, the outside world are, hey, I heard what's going on at your church down there. I mean, do you, you call yourselves Christians? Do you guys have any morals whatsoever? Can you see the mess that this would create in a, a small community of believers? And he said, you know what? This person has caused grief to the whole congregation. And that grief is that uh, as he stepped into that sin, and then the Corinthians, as it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, they were not, rather than being grieved themselves, they gloried that they were so free and so liberal and so loving and so non judgmental. And that's not the kind of qualities they needed to be displaying at that time. You see, they needed a discipline, as it says in verse 6. This punishment, which was inflicted by the majority, is sufficient for such a man. They disciplined him. They, uh, they put him in the penalty box, so to speak. You know, if you ever watch hockey and somebody has some penalty, they get put in the penalty box. And they might be, if it's a minor penalty, it's, it's for two minutes. And you can get two, you know, a couple of minor things stacked up. But if it's a major penalty, it's five to ten minutes. And when you're in the penalty box, as a player, nobody can come in and substitute. So the team out there, your teammates, because you have sinned, if you will, you violated the rules of the game, now your teammate are one person short. And so the opposing team, especially if it's a na major penalty of five to ten minutes, which seems like an eternity as far as sports are concerned, now they can do what is called in hockey a power play. And the power play is all of the individuals on the other team, obviously, there's more of them than because you're, you're guys in the penalty box, and they have the opportunity to score in their power play. And in a sense, in a, a spiritual illustration, this guy had went into the penalty box, and it had caused a lot of problems in the church. But now this guy's getting out of the penalty box because you see, he was finally grieved, convicted, filled with sorrow as the Holy Spirit broke through the hardness of his own heart and the lies and the deceptions of the devil. And now his heart was wanting to get right and come back in, out of the penalty box, into the full love, belonging, acceptance, and fellowship of the church. But now the church doesn't want to receive him because Paul spoke to him so strongly about kicking him out until he repents. But now that he's repented, they don't know how to receive him back in the right way. Isn't it weird? The Corinthians were slow not to discipline, and so Paul had to kick him into the seat of the pants, discipline. And now that they've disciplined, he's coming back to repent, and Paul has to kick him into the seat of the pants and say, forgive him. <laughs> Isn't it weird how we humans are constantly imbalanced in the way we approach things? Have you ever had to confront somebody in sin? Is it fun? No, it's not fun. I mean, I, I would much rather go to Cold Stone and get a Sunday, Right? Then, then confront somebody in their sin. It, it's no fun. But do you know that within the house of the Lord, and that's why Paul the Apostle, as he unburdens his heart and he instructs you and I from God's word, he gives us mature thinking. This is how we're to grow in our walk with the Lord. And let me tell you, if you're going to triumph in ministry, you have to understand that ministry is messy, but you have to have the courage to confront sin. But then you have to have the courage to forgive sinners. You see, that's a balance between those two things. It's just like raising kids. 
Having raised a couple of kids and they're off in their own marriages, it takes love, truth, and discipline to raise kids. And we loved our kids and we told them the truth. And when they were out of line, they got disciplined. But when you discipline them, it's not like, okay, for the next 20 years, you're grounded or the next 20 years, go to your room. No, there's a process. The whole point of discipline is to bring a correction in behavior and restoration to the family, right? It's correction of behavior, restoration of the family. That's what discipline's all about. It's, it's really initiated, and the motive of it is love. That's what Paul the Apostle is trying to communicate. There are many churches today in America, because of the atmosphere that we have of political correctness, also the fear of confronting people, that literally people will sue you, they'll take you to the courts, all kinds of things within the congregation of the Lord And you have to understand, it takes courage to confront sin, but it also takes courage to forgive broken sinners. Because you see, there's a, at at each one of us in this room, each one of us might err to one side or the other of that. Some of us are very accepting. You would receive them back quickly, but you would have never been the one to confront. Some of you are quick to confront, but once you've confronted, it's almost like even if they do repent, you're going to hold them at arm's length the rest of your life. That's not forgiveness. That's not restoration. How can you go through this life and and experience this process and experience triumph? Now, look how Paul says it with such uh, really beautiful language to give us three words that need to take place in this broken sinner who has repented. He's filled with sorrow. He wants to get right with God. He has gotten right with God, but the congregation has not accepted him back. Has somebody come to you and asked for forgiveness and you're unwilling to extend it? You're unwilling to move forward with life? Do they feel like from now on they're gonna be a second-class citizen as far as you're concerned? Listen to what Paul says. He says in verse seven, so that on the contrary, you ought rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. Therefore, verse eight, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. He says, I want you to forgive him, I want you to comfort him. I want you to reaffirm your love. Three things that need to take place if you're going to restore a broken sinner into fellowship, into the house of the Lord, there needs to be forgiveness and comfort. It's this picture of restoring friendly relationships. You know when you're at odds with somebody and you give them that, you know, cold face? But friendly relationships are, how are you? It's great to have you back. Glad you're repentant. I'm glad you're we can forgive you. And now we want to comfort you. It literally means to come alongside them. So you want to forgive, which has this picture of friendliness and comfort. You want to come alongside them. And then you want to reaffirm your love to them. And sometimes you have to go overboard and reaffirm and comforting people because what does he say? Lest this guy be overcome and swallowed up with too much sorrow. How does it feel to be the sinner yourself that have messed up? How does it feel in the family when you've blown it and you're, you've hurt your wife's heart or you've hurt your husband's heart or you've hurt a child's heart or you've hurt a parent's heart and you want to come and you want to come in brokenness but you don't feel like they're really receiving your repentance. They, you don't feel like they're receiving uh, and extending forgiveness. There's no comfort. There's no friendliness. There's no reaffirmation of love and you already feel like such a dork because you've blown it. You've sinned. You sin in such a way that, I mean, you just feel like you're teetering on this place of, of condemnation. And, and realize all the way through this process that the, the devil is wanting to destroy at every turn. He wants to, d- to destroy a church, as we'll see in a moment, that we're not ignorant of his devices. He wants to destroy by getting the guy first into the sexual situation. And then he wants to get the congregation into a place of, uh, of not dealing with the situation. And then finally when he's kicked out, then the devil wants to condemn this guy so that when he does repent, he's now not received in forgiveness and comforted by them and reaffirmed in love and so that the devil can swallow him up with too much sorrow. You may be here tonight and you are overwhelmed with the sorrow over your own sin, over your past. And the devil is trying to swallow you up. You've messed up. There's no no two ways about it. You have sinned and you've made a mess of things and you've hurt people, but now in brokenness and you seeking repentance and forgiveness, God wants to restore. But you can't find a place in the hearts of those who you've hurt to experience that forgiveness. 
But God wants that to take place. There are times in my life where I've sought somebody's forgiveness and they are just unwilling to extend it. They're going to hang that over my head for the rest of my life with an unwillingness to become friendly again, to come alongside again, and to reaffirm, hey, I love you. I care for you. It takes as much courage to confront sin as it does to comfort and to forgive sin. So he tells us in verse 9 and 10, For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. Paul the Apostle, as the leader of this fellowship, he founded it as the Apostle. He said, I just wanted to see if you guys would obey what I've instructed you to do. And, and he did that through them confronting the sin, and now he's giving them an opportunity to forgive so that when you get these two things down, you guys, when you get it down in your marriage, you get it down with your children, you get it down within the workplace, you get it down within church, and when this becomes a part of the very fiber of your being, you know how to lovingly confront sin, and you also know how to forgive and restore, man, you've become a package of usefulness for God. You've discovered triumph in relationships when this begins to take place. He says in verse 10, Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. And if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. That literally means before the very face of Jesus, he says four times, I've forgiven. I've joined you guys in forgiveness. You see, there needs to be a unity in the leadership and in the congregation of the Lord for forgiveness. Sometimes leadership wants to forgive somebody in the congress. Is like, how, how come you're being so gracious to them? How come you're forgiving them? Well, because they've repented. We've had people that have, have fallen off the deep end in all kinds of sin in our congregation over the years. And once they're genuinely repentant and sorrowful, we forgive them. We accept them, and they're, and they're welcome. And we treat them like nothing ever happened. That's what the Lord does with you and me, right? Don't you want to treat people the exact same way that, that you want to be treated? That's the way the Lord treats me. That's the way we treat them. But we've had people over the years in the congregation of the Lord, like, how come the leadership, we're leaving the church. If you're going to forgive somebody that could do that, look at the passage. This is the instruction of a mature, godly person in the house of the Lord. And so there are times that people have left the church because we've chosen to forgive a repentant sinner and that they're welcome. And I'm just like, well, God bless you. Maybe you can go to another fellowship and have fellowship with other people that also will never forgive broken people. But shame on you the day that you're the one that stumbles and falls and nobody will restore you. Then the shoe will be on the other foot, won't it? And you'll be coming back here because you know we forgive sinners. It's a weird thing. It really is to me, a really weird thing. Because there are those who withhold forgiveness because somebody has stumbled and fallen and they take the position of the high and the holy. You, yourself, and I, myself, are a couple of decisions away from ruining my life every day of my life. Every day. I'm not beyond you. You're not beyond me. We are all broken, flawed people. And I am extra gracious with people because when I fall on my face, I want people to be extra gracious with me. But it does not negate the need to be broken, repentant, and sorrowful over what you've done. Because some people are brazen and calloused and you sense that there's no real brokenness and there's no real repentance and there's no real sorrow. And that's really hard to work with because you don't, you don't see the fruit of that. Well, Paul tells us that there's a unity that needs to be taking place between the, the congregation and the leadership. But then he tells us there needs to be an awareness in verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. We don't want Satan to rip us off. That's what it means to be taken advantage of. Somebody rips you off. He wants to rip you off and either get you into sin and nobody courageously confronts you. Or they courageously confront you and now you want forgiveness and they won't receive that. Or he wants to swallow somebody up with too much sorrow. The devil has come to steal. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He never has a good day. He wants to ruin your marriage. He wants to ruin your children. He wants to ruin the church. He wants to ruin people's lives. That's what he does. And so we need to be aware of his devices, not ignorant of those devices. If you're going through a time of destruction and you feel like all these fiery darts are coming from every different direction, are you ignorant of the devices that we are, do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but with principalities and power? and rulers of this dark present age. Satan wants to destroy your life. 
And so once you realize that, oh, he wants to get me in sin, and once he gets me into sin, then he wants to condemn me for the sin, and then he wants the people around me that really love me not to confront me in my sin, and then when I repent, then he wants them not to forgive and, and restore, and he wants me to be swallowed up with this sense of shame and condemnation and guilt, but through the blood of Jesus, there is no shame, there is no condemnation, as there is no guilt for the child of God. Amen? And that's what your heart and my heart needs, and that's where the triumph is. You see, there's triumph in ministry that is it's kind of messy, though. We go through all kinds of stuff all the time, and it is messy. If you, if you don't want to be around messes, don't get involved with ministry. <laughs> because, uh, and, and we're just kind of used to it. We're just not really afraid of it. You just kind of roll up your sleeves and say, hey, we're going to deal with this. We're going to deal with it. But let me tell you, there's nothing more beautiful than when somebody falls and stumbles and then you confront them, and then there's repentance and restoration. As you restore that friendly relationship, and you come alongside them, and you reaffirm your love, you're deeper and stronger and longer in your relationship than you're ever going to be, because they know for the first time, when I fall on my face, you're going to help me up. You're not going to kick me in the teeth, but you're not going to let me get away with it either. You love me enough to confront me. So Paul the Apostle wants to lay this out for the Corinthians so that we can experience the healthiness and the wholeness. And churches today are afraid of to, to do both, to confront or to forgive really nefarious sin or wicked sin, sinners. And he goes on, you see our triumph number two in our outline is our triumph is of an affectionate reality. Paul says in verse 12 and 13, notice what he says. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. Paul the apostle said, I've been, he's waiting for Titus who took this letter uh, the previous letter, and he took this letter, and now Paul is just, have you ever read, uh, wrote a difficult letter or a difficult email or some kind of text, and now you're waiting for the results of that? You're re- waiting for what's going to come back and what, it, what will be the uh, receptivity of that letter? And so he was so anxious, he went to Troas, and he began to preach the gospel like he did everywhere, and God opened this incredible door, but he's conveying to them in such an open, transparent, authentic, honest way, he's being real with his affection and the reality of that affection. He said, I, was, I, I had this incredible open door, for, but all I could think about was you guys and how you were responding to the letter, and I couldn't even minister effectively. I just, I, just, I just couldn't even minister effectively. I just had to leave. You see, as a pastor, and you go through a lot of relational conflict, uh, statistically, a pastor of a congregation goes through a major conflict in the church every six months. And as you're going through these major conflicts, there's times that you're trying to wrestle through things and, and you're having meetings and you're, you're dealing with sometimes sinful issues and you need to discipline. And, but I have to prepare a message. You see, Wednesday night and Saturday night and Sunday morning, do not stop because you're going through a difficult thing, right? And here I am, I'm supposed to be studying for this time that's blocked out for this five hours on this day or these four hours on this day. And I'm trying to work through that, but all I can think about is this difficulty I'm working through. I can't get my head you know, into the passage of Scripture. That I'm, I, I'm, and you feel like, man, I just, I just want to have the, one of the assistants share because I can't even get my head in the game. And that's what Paul's saying. Man, God, open this incredible door. And look at the honesty that Paul lays out because he's showing them the reality of his affection. Because if I don't care about you, you're no distraction to me at all. You know what I mean? If I don't care, if my heart and mind and soul is not wrapped up in this deal, if I could, if I am I as cold as ice, I'm not troubled. I'm walking through all those open doors. I can study fine. Why? Because I really don't care. But Paul does care. Paul here starts in what takes place when he says that he comes to Troas and he departed for, for, for Macedonia starts what Bible teachers call from this verse, verse 13 of chapter 2 here in 2 Corinthians, all the way through verse 5 of chapter 7, which is called Paul's great digression. And he now digresses all the way, basically chapter the rest of chapter 2, the chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, all the way to the fifth verse of chapter 7 to unburden his heart, to share in the most intimate details the struggles of his life and the difficulties he's having ministering to these people. What an openness. 
You see, there's a triumph in the reality of our affection for people. But sometimes it, it brings us to tears as you're sharing with people that you love. Sometimes, and through fasting and prayer, that you would rather have, you would rather have God reach and reconcile and minister in this relationship than even your daily food. And so there may be fasting and prayer for a number of days as you're trying to work through these issues. You see, if, if, you, if your heart's stone cold as a pastor, you really have very little effectiveness with your people that you're seeking to minister to. It's like a husband. If, he, if his heart's stone cold towards his wife, I mean, how are you going to... How are you really going to enter into a deeper place in a relationship or with your kids? If your kids feel like you, you just walk in the room and you lay out the rules and, and you feel like they, they feel like there's never any affection, that somehow they've never made it through the, the exterior of your hard heart into the interior of your very soul. But when you, the people you love, your wife, your husband, your kids, even your coworkers or other people in the congregation, when they sense the reality of your affection for them as you communicate with them, there is triumph. Because it's an old cliche, but cliches are just really well-worn truths, aren't they? Nobody cares how much you know unless they know how much you care. That's why people that really don't care and they try to engage and dialogue other people, people can sense it. They're like, here you are confirming. I, I, I can tell you, you could care less for me. You're just here like on an errand. But Paul here unloads his heart to share with them this incredible thing. Look what it says in chapter 7, verse 5 and 6, as Paul then breaks out of that digression. He says, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Nevertheless, God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. When Titus came and he brought news that they received the letter that Paul had written, oh, he could have a big sigh of relief because now there was a restoration, a reconciliation. Now Paul goes into... This, thirdly, in our little outline here, our triumph is in Christ. You see, if I'm going to be involved with restoration, it's, it's all about Jesus helping with that restoration. And if I'm going to really share my affection and a reality of my affection, then Jesus has to be working in my heart. And Paul here says in verse 14 through 16, he talks about this triumph of Christ. And he's painting a picture that was very uh, well known in the Roman world. Look at it with me, starting at verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life, and who is sufficient for these things? Paul says, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. Serving God can be a triumphant experience. And you see, for the Roman world, when you spoke of literally the triumph, it described in that one phrase an entire scene. The Roman triumph, which is well documented in history, is this incredible military parade. We would call it in America a ticker tape parade. If, uh, you know, back in 1951 when Douglas MacArthur, the general, famous general of the United States of America, when he was finally relieved of his duty because he basically wanted to take the fight in Korea to China, um, and President Truman relieved him of his duty, but he came home to a hero's welcome. And he came through the streets of New York, and a million people showed up to celebrate and throw out confetti out of the windows, and, and, and they call that area of Manhattan, it's the uh, financial district, they call it the hallway or the, excuse me, the canyon of heroes. The canyon of heroes. As they come through there, there's this incredible military procession. When Neil Armstrong went to the moon, walked on the moon, came back in 1969, on August 13th, four million people lined the streets in New York for these astronauts' welcome, and they went on a 45-day tour around the world, people celebrating their victory. 
And that, all, that whole idea and thought comes from the Roman triumph. You see, the Roman triumph went like this. It usually was about two and a half miles long. It went on a very slow pace, a long parade, if you will. And it might take even a couple of days. The prisoners in chains who were destined for execution, sometimes even with their families, were first in the procession. And then the spoils of war were on carts, the gold, the silver, all of the the precious stones. And then paintings or models of the significant places and battles were a part of the procession. Then came the bodyguards of the king himself. Then came, or excuse me, the general, the conquering general. And then the general came in his four-horse chariot. And in that chariot was a servant of his or his youngest child. And then uh, after that came uh, the officers and his oldest children on horseback. After that came the chanting and the singing about the triumph. And then there were these two flawless white oxen that they were leading to be sacrificed at the end of the triumph. And all along, these pagan priests were going along with the triumph with these censers, which are metal uh, containers with holes in them. And there was incense, and they were going along the whole triumph. So the entire triumph had what? A very strong aroma of the incense that was going. So for everybody that was in the victory parade, what did that smell like? That smelled like victory to me. Smelled like life to me. Man, that's good smelling. We just, we just kicked their tails. woo Go fight win, right? But for the prisoners who are headed to execution, what was that smell telling them? You are dead as a doornail. You are toast, man. At the end of this parade, you're done. And so Paul takes this picture of the Roman triumph and he says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in Christ Jesus in triumph. You see, he's our great general. And the spoils of war are souls that are saved. And those who are a part of this incredible journey that we have, that our conquering king, the Lord Jesus, has conquered the enemy of our souls, the devil and all of his demonic horde, and he has given us triumph. And as he has given us triumph, it says, through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place you go. Everywhere you go, your life, Paul the Apostle says, is like those priests who are swinging the incense. And there was this incredible aroma that when you come among, it says to the Lord, that you and I are a fragrance. We're diffusing, you know, your, your own little scentsy candle. Every one of us are giving off that aroma of Christ, and that aroma to those who uh, are being saved is life. It's the aroma of life. Man, we're saved. Here we are on Wednesday night, and that's the beautiful thing about Wednesday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning. It's the only time in our week where we're the majority, right? You're going to go to work tomorrow, and you're working with a bunch of heathen dogs. And here you are. You're coming in. You're like the Cincy Candle. And some of them wonder the brother, go, here comes the Jesus nut. Here he is. Yeah, he's going to tell me what he learned last night at church. I was just in the gym this week, and there's a brother in the Lord, and uh, he was talking to this guy, and he came up to me, and he said, yeah, I've been sharing with this guy uh, you know, all the time, because they're both retired guys, so they're always in the gym. <laughs> and, and he said, and I've been sharing my faith with him, and he said, it's just been going on and on. And he had this big smile on his face. He's so excited. He's just in the gym, diffusing the fragrance of Christ wherever he goes. He's sharing his faith. And that other guy walked away like, you know, you know and off he went. You see, the aroma of your life in Christ Jesus, Paul the Apostle says, this fragrance that we're diffusing is the aroma of death or the aroma of life. Something beautiful like life or the aroma of something stinks like death. And to an unbeliever, your life smells like a dead, rotting corpse. They hate the message of Christ. They don't like your smell at all in a figurative sense. Isn't it interesting when you're around people and they have their aroma, right? They have either super strong perfume. You're like, whoa, a little bit of that goes a long ways. Sometimes you're walking 30 feet behind them and it's just like this fog. Or there's a guy that, I mean, he's used half of his, you know, aqua velvet, on, old spice on his, and he's just going through. You're like, <coughs> have you ever had somebody just like, it takes your breath away because they have so much aroma going on. My daughter, she wanted to work 
at a, one of those coffee huts. So she went to work at this coffee hut. And my daughter Jess has this long, blonde, beautiful hair. But everywhere she goes, her hair absorbs whatever smells that are going on. So when she would come home at the end of the day, she smelled like this latte. <laughs> she smelled like coffee, fresh ground coffee in her hair. And that's, I like that smell. So I'd give her a hug at the end of each day, and she's like 16 years old, and I'd give her a big hug. Mmm, smell that fresh coffee. And she got kind of tired of that job, and she said, I want to work at a bakery. So she went to work at a bakery, and every day she came home, and see, I'm, I'm kind of a sweets nut, chocolate chips, cookies. And she had come home smelling like a chocolate chip cookie from the bakery, and I thought, Ah, oh, that's great. And then she wanted to work with horses. <laughs> so there's an indoor arena out there at Ryrie, and she's out there, and she's mucking stalls, and she would come home and lit her blonde hair, her beautiful blonde hair. I'd give her a hug at the end of the day, and it smelled just like horse urine. It was just, oh, <laughs> whoo, that takes my breath away. That's, that's some powerful stuff going on right there. But did you know that your life is like that? Your life to a saved person or a believer, those who are, are saved, is like an incredible aroma. That's why it's so fun to hang out with you guys on Wednesday night or Saturday night or Sunday morning or, uh, you know, you're working together or you're hanging out at home fellowship or you're just going out for dinner or you're spending time together because it's the only time that you feel like you have life with life. But don't be surprised when the world thinks you smell like death. Don't be surprised when the family members mock you. And Jesus, Jesus said, blessed are you when men persecute you and they speak all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake because he says, great is your reward. See, I was unprepared when I became a Christian for the hostility of this world. I, I, I was not well educated in the Bible. I didn't really have um, strong Christians in my life at that time. And when people began to persecute me and make fun of me for my faith, I, I didn't know how to react. I didn't know that people were not as excited about Jesus as I was. And so here, Paul the Apostle says that God always leads us in triumph because our triumph is in Jesus. Jesus said, you know, don't be surprised when the world hates you because it hated me first, he says in John 15. So, he says this, he, a, he, he asks this question at the end of verse 16. He says, who is sufficient for these things? Everything we've talked about thus far in this digression here, or even prior to the digression, who's sufficient for this? When you think about confronting somebody in their sin, or you think about forgiving somebody and restoring relationship, or you think about really being open and showing the reality of your affection for someone, or even living the Christian life in such a way that your coworkers, your family, your neighbors, everybody that hangs out with you and spends any time with you is going to know about your faith in Jesus. How do you feel about that? Do you ever feel overwhelmed just about the whole deal, the whole Christian life? You're just like, man, I don't know if I can do this. I just don't know if I can do this. I mean, the guys at work hate my guts, and my father-in-law doesn't want to, you know, see us anymore, and have you ever just felt overwhelmed by wanting to walk with God? Have you ever felt like no matter how you take one step forward and it seems like you get pushed back two steps in your walk with God? And Paul the Apostle knows he's laying out some very strong things to us. And even the thought of you going to work or, uh, and diffusing the fragrance of Christ at your place of work, it's intimidating, isn't it? There's times that you think the Lord moves on your heart to go share with this person or go share with that person and you, you get all nervous and shaky and your hands start sweating. You're like, I gotta go share my faith. And Paul says, Who are, who's sufficient for these things? He asks that question. He's gonna answer it in the next chapter, but just to give you a little insight what he says in that third chapter that we'll look at next week. In chapter three, verse five and six, and look what he says of 2 Corinthians. Not that... We are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. He says that God, our sufficiency is from God, and He gives us sufficiency to be His ministers. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, God wants to empower you, empower me, help us in our day-to-day -day life to be the, this fragrance that everywhere you go is the fragrance of Christ. 
And there are those, those who are perishing that thinks that our, the smell of Jesus stinks. And there are those who are being saved that thinks it's the greatest aroma they've ever smelled in their life. Well, lastly and fourthly in this passage, we see our triumph is in sincerity. You know, unless you and I are sincere in our approach to these things, people can spot a phony a mile away, can't they? Have you ever been just kind of disgusted in the deep pit of your stomach by some phony? I mean, it's, it, it's just, there's just something about it that just turns your stomach because you can sense that. And, and Paul the Apostle wants them to know is in this last verse of this chapter that his triumph was in his approach of sincerity. Look what he says in verse 17. For we are not as so many peddling the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. And when he says peddling the word of God, it means to corrupt God's word. It means that he's coming along some, like some kind of huckster or a snake oil salesman. It's, it, it's not a person that's just trying to grab a hold of you in the mall and get something in your hand so they can get you in and buy, buy something. It's not somebody coming out and begging you to come into their shop. He, because there are always going to be people like that. And, and if there's anything that really brings disrepute to the cause of Jesus, it's phony hucksters that are going forth and preaching God's word in the name of God, but their motive is either greed or their motive is wanting to be seen by people. Their motive is all messed up and it's all twisted. And when people see that and they get that bad taste in their mouth about ministers that don't have a right heart for the Lord and a right heart to love God's people, it turns them off. And I have met people over the years, person after person, that said, you know, I was involved in church and X, Y, and Z happened. And it was because this leader treated them this way and this was him, his motive. And you want to tell them, hey, don't, don't judge the Lord Jesus and having a relationship with him because of this guy's stupid example. Get your eyes on the Lord, not on this person. But it's hard to separate for humans people in their relationship with God and they're representing God. This is something that's vitally important from God's perspective for us to, clear, to properly represent him. Ask Moses. You see, Moses and Aaron, one day, the children of Israel came complaining. Now, that was their MO. That was their mode of operation. Uh, they came, and they were complaining, and they wanted water. And so the Lord spoke to Moses. Now, God wasn't angry with the people at this time for w wanting water. They were thirsty. There were different times that God was angry, but he wasn't angry this time. And so he told Moses, now you go speak to the rock. Before he had struck the rock, but now he wants him to speak to the rock. But Moses gets there, and for some reason, Mo Moses, who's the meekest man on the whole earth, uh, he, he blows a gasket. He just loses it. He says, oh, shall I fetch water out of this rock for you rebels? And he strikes the rock, and God told him to speak to it. Now, God was gracious to the people. God was gracious even to Moses and Aaron to use them. That water did come out of the rock, but then the Lord said, hey, you two, come over here. I'm going to talk to you. And when they came over there, he said, because you chose not to hallow me in the eyes of the people, that I was not angry with the people, and you gave the people the impression that I was in a rage against them, and I was not. They misrepresented the Lord. And the Lord because said, said, because you've misrepresented me, basically, you're not going to go into the promised land. And Moses begged him and begged him, no, Lord, I'm sorry. Please, 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 pretty please, let me go into the promised land. He said, enough. Stop. Don't ask me again that if you can go to the promised land. I'm telling you, you can't go into the promised land. Why couldn't Moses go into the promised land? Because he did not properly represent the Lord. Now, thank God for his grace and the blood of Jesus that makes it possible for you and I. There's many times that you and I have failed the Lord and not represented him properly. To a neighbor, to a friend, to somebody, especially in the early days of my Christian life, early days of even ministry life, and you're trying to learn and grow. And the only way to learn how to make good decisions is from your bad decisions. But to grow so that you're not misrepresenting the Lord. And here, Paul the Apostle, he says, you know, we're not peddlers of God's word. He says, but as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. He says, I want to be sincere with you. I'm representing God. I'm coming to you on God's behalf. And then he says, I'm speaking in the sight of God. 
Every minister of the gospel needs to keep in mind that I am speaking right now, not only in your sight, but I am speaking in the sight of God. God is watching me. God is listening to me. God is wanting to know if I have properly represented this passage of Scripture to the people of the Lord. That's my job. That's my calling. And one day I will give an account for it. And sometimes it terrifies me to think about giving account for what God's called me to do. Because James 3.1 says, not many should seek to be teachers because they will have the stricter or harsher judgment, which is just a flat out, it's one of the saddest verses in all the Bible from my perspective. Because God's gonna judge me stricter and more harshly than you. You go, well, I'm happy about that. Well, I'm bummed about that. I mean, it's really a drag. But how else would he keep his ministers accountable if he did not tell them, you better properly represent me And Paul the Apostle said, I am coming to you sincerely. I am coming to you from God. And I am coming and declaring this message in the sight of God. And this is something that everybody that serves God, if you're here and you teach a home Bible study or you're sharing your faith or you're teaching a Sunday school class or you're representing God, then we want to do it sincerely. I encourage people that seem to have kind of twisted motives, that have a desire for ministry, I tell them, why don't you do something else? Why don't you go do something else? Well, you know, and and they'll go on and I say, you know, it doesn't really seem like, I mean, it seems like you have a different agenda from just simply serving God and serving the people. It would be better for you to be out, be a framer, be a mechanic, be an engineer, Go, go do something else because this is the reality. One day we will give an account to the Lord. And so it's best to do it in a place of simplicity and sincerity. And just with a heart that says, hey, you know what, I really, I want to experience this triumphant Christian life. And that's the beautiful thing about this, our triumph in serving God. God gives us all the resources, he gives us all the tools that we need to get the job done. And Paul lays it out there, and he's speaking to a church that had lots of challenges, lots of difficulties. Paul said that the purpose of the commandment, look at this as we close in 1 Timothy 1.5, it says the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. Every day of the Christian life, God wants to bring us to that place where there's a a love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. And that's his goal, to do that work internally inside your heart and life and mind in my heart and mind. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, there may be those who tonight just really seem like to them they're being swallowed up with too much sorrow. They've turned, they've repented, they're, they've, they've, they want the very... Um, your will to be accomplished in their life and and yet they feel somehow on the outs. They feel somehow that they have not been forgiven and maybe because of some sin and failure in their past. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us in whatever context that is, whether it's just this closing prayer or a one-on-one time afterwards to, Lord, express your love and, and to reaffirm that love to them. Lord, I pray for those who uh, are just in that place right now. They they know a brother or sister that they need to talk to because they they simply are in some kind of blatant sin and, and they haven't had the courage to confront them. Lord, I pray that you would give them the grace to lovingly talk to their brother or sister in Christ. And Lord, I pray that when it comes to forgiving and restoring and reaffirming that love, that we would be free in our souls to do that. Lord, would you help us to apply these things and to pray these things and to uh, accept these things and receive them into our hearts and our minds so that we could walk in the triumphant reality of who you are, Jesus. Thank you for your love for us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.